Welcome, everyone. I feel like making the announcement. If you're um, hoping to be on the flight that is called Israel One on One, you're in the right place. Um, I'm Rabbi Bradley Thompson, joined by Rabbi Neil Zuckerman from Park Avenue Synagogue. Uh, we thought it would be really important, given all that's going on in the world, to take a step back and um, spend two weeks, two hours uh, this tonight, this Wednesday night, and next Thursday night. Um, reconnecting to some of the important history and historical moments. Um, we are recording this session, so if you know someone who can't be here, we will be sharing uh, on our um, Israel content page. Uh, Park Avenue Synagogue has an easy-to-find set of Israel resources, um, and the link to the recording of tonight's session will be available probably by the end of the day tomorrow on our um, Israel resources page. And there's a whole wealth of information there that we wanna encourage you to check out if you haven't um, already um, in terms of places to donate, updates, um, prayer, tefillot, uh, all different kinds of resources. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this is an Israel 101 um, program, meaning uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground over a very short amount of time. Uh, it's very likely that you'll be left with more questions than answered answers, and um, we'll be happy to suggest uh, places for further reading as we go. Um, and then we want to say two other things before we dive in. Uh, that is that um, the study of the history of modern Israel, the state of Israel, the people of Israel, the land of Israel, is also the study of how the Jewish people have changed in significant ways in terms of identity, theology, politics, and much more. Uh, and I think both Rabbi Zuckerman and I are going to point out um, changes in mindset, changes in theology, changes in practice um, that happened because of the relationship of the Jewish people to the land uh, and the state of Israel. The other thing we want to say um, at the outset is that uh, the study of the history of Israel is like peeling an onion. It's an incredibly complex subject with infinite layers. Um, if anyone tells you that there is one answer or that they know the facts or the truth, you should probably um, it should probably give you pause. Uh, again, this is going to be a survey speed history course. Uh, but we do want to encourage you to be critical thinkers, critical historians, to ask questions, um, to ask what else there is to know, what's the context, and what else is going on. Um, to that end, please um, ask questions in the chat function. We'll be monitoring the chat function. Uh, we may wait to ask a question, answer a question, um, because the answer may be forthcoming. But please, um, the chat function is the best place to um, ask questions. There's a lot of people here. We're at uh, more than 165 people and counting. Uh, so that's just going to be the best place to um, ask your questions, and we'll try and answer them as we go. And with that, Rabbi Zuckerman, um, I, I owe you six minutes. Um, okay. You get started. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to see uh, faces, and uh, thank you for uh, for joining us. Uh, just to echo Rabbi Solmson, um, you know, we could we could tell this story in dozens of different ways. Uh, I think that um, for the purposes of the next two weeks, we're going to try to focus on a number of dates uh, and, and describe what was happening uh, in the world and with the Jewish people at that time that led to the establishment of the state of Israel. Now, um, oftentimes, well, if we were to really do an exhaustive a survey of Zionism, uh, we would, um, you know, we would start back in biblical times, right? Like Zionism is not a new idea um, in the modern era. Jews for thousands of years have have looked to the land of Israel. Uh, it became um, ritualized, right? So the direction we face is to the land of Israel. People would put what's called a Mizrach, uh, something on the wall of their home, which would point where East is, right? Um, liturgically, we say, L'shana haba'a b'yerushalayim, right? So there is, right, right, so to suggest that, you know, Zionism is some sort of modern phenomenon, I think is simply ahistorical. Uh, with that said, 
uh, political Zionism, right? The actual, uh, you know, arriving at the idea that there needs to be a political solution to the Jewish question in Europe, mainly what do we do with our Jews? And to suggest that the answer to that question is a destination, a land in the land of Israel, well, that's already something new, right? That's already a new phenomenon in Jewish history. And while it is tempting to begin that process with, um, you know, the idea that, that uh, Herzl, Theodor Herzl, you know, covering the Dreyfus trial, um, you know, had his, uh, you know, Jewish identity ignited and came up with this idea. Um, I was, uh, it was, it was this past summer where I was doing some reading for a sermon that I discovered that that's actually not the accepted theory today. Uh, that Herzl's um, Jewish identity began to emerge and, and the, the idea that there needs to be a Jewish home emerged, you know, when he was in college and confronted some anti-Semitism. So rather than start um, with the Dreyfus affair, I actually want to start in 1903. 1903, and you can see the, the screen in front of you. Today we're going to talk about, go back one screen, Rabbi. Uh, today we're going to talk about the birth of modern Zionism, uh, we're going to talk about the Balfour Declaration, and then we'll get to the partition plan and the founding of the state. I want to ground the next 10 minutes of discussion in um, the year 1903 uh, in, in the town of, of Kishnev, right, was the Kishnev pogrom. And, uh, this was a, a, um, a burst of violence uh, towards the Jews, um, you know, uh, and, and there's a lot written on Kishnev, and, and to me, it, it, it is, a, is a pivotal moment in Jewish history, and I'm going to tell you why in a couple minutes, but just to give you the background, um, it was a pogrom, right? There were uh, thousands of people who started to, um, to beat Jews of all ages to death with crowbars, with clubs. Um, there were women who were raped, uh, bodies were torn apart. Um, people were, were, bodies were mutilated. If this sounds familiar, it's because we lived through another version of this on October 7th. Uh, women were raped, women were raped in front of families. Uh, rioters trashed synagogues, uh, they soiled say, uh, Torah scrolls. Um, it was a, a brutal attack, uh, an indescribable attack, um, and I'm not exaggerating it. And all you have to do is just Google Kishnev to get a, I think there were around 50 people killed, but, um, and while the number uh, may sound low compared to other moments that we know about in Jewish history, it marked a turning point in how the Jewish people viewed themselves. And the reason that that happened was because Chaim Nachman Bialik, one of the great, great um, you know, Jewish writers and poets, uh, was asked to go report on this event. And for over a month, Bialik lived in Kishnev and spoke to survivors of this pogrom. He filled four notebooks with information um, and he chose to report, to write a poem called The City of Slaughter, which essentially told the story of Jews as victims, Jews with trembling knees, Jews who hid behind, um, you know, columns while, while you know, people raped their wives and, and were, were murdering people. You know, he poor, even though he knew, and we, when we, we, we know he knew that there were people who fought back, but the way he chose to tell the story was to view Jews as victims. Now, Bradley, you can go to the next slide. Um, and uh, yeah, Bialik, so, um, you know, just as a just to give you a sense of, of his words, do not fail to note in the dark corners of Kishnev, crouching husbands, bridegrooms, brothers peering through the craps of the cracks of their shelters, watching their wives, sisters, daughters writhing beneath their bestial defilers, suffocating in their own blood, their flesh portioned out as booty, wrote Bialik. Um, 
There were other accounts to tell, but this was the story that Bialik chose to tell. And as he told this story, a narrative of the Jewish people began to emerge that Zionism wasn't only just a political solution to the question of the Jews. Zionism was a therapeutic, uh, Bradley, someone's saying they don't see the slides. Um, Zionism was a, a therapeutic process for the Jew to heal him or herself as a result of living in the diaspora for so long. In other words, it wasn't just that Jews didn't control their own destiny. Jews were sick spiritually by living in the diaspora. And the only way to heal them was to create the new Jew. And Bialik, by choosing to tell the story the way he did, sort of sets the stage for the emergence of this new fighting Jew who would go to the land and would pick up weapons and would defend themselves. Now, I wanna just share with you um, a few other sort of responses from Kishna before I turn it over to Rabbi Solomson. Um, because, right, because the way Bialik will choose to tell this story will impact how other Zionists began to see the project of self-determination of Zionism, including Herzl himself. So if you go to the next slide, Rabbi. You know, to Herzl, uh, Kishnev was was simply further evidence that Jews desperately needed a home wherever they could create it. And by the way, Herzl at one point was entertaining the idea of the we call it the Uganda proposal It really wasn't Uganda per se, but it was this poor part of Africa that was, you know, sort of bounced around and um, and it almost blew up the entire uh, project of Zionism, uh, the Sixth Zionist Congress in uh, August of 1903. So after the Kishnev pogrom, um, you know, Herzl says this statement, uh, Kishnev exists wherever Jews undergo bodily or spiritual torture, wherever their self-respect is injured and their property despoiled because they are Jews, let us save those who can still be saved, right? You see the, you know, you see the spiritual condition, right? Kishnev isn't just a physical place. Kishnev for Herzl becomes an existential state of the Jewish people that needs to be, that needs to be resolved. So not only will Jews have a place of their own, and again, at this point, Herzl is um, entertaining the idea of, um, of, uh, of, 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 of a place for the Jews outside of the land of Israel, but ultimately that will get rejected. And Herzl himself feels that, you know, he, he was a failure, right, after this Sixth Zionist Congress. Um, so, uh, you know, I want to, Bradley, go to the next slide. Um, we begin, you know, so there's the response of Herzl, and I'm, I'm cherry picking some of the Zionist responses here because it's, it's, uh, it's significant the way people will respond to Kishnev, but I want to look at uh, two more in particular because we start to see uh, we start to see the emergence of this new Jew that I was spoke speaking about as a result of, of Kishnev. And one of the most famous and important statements comes from a man named Max Nordell, uh, who was a close confidant of Herzl, and um, you know Nordell writes about the Jewry of muscle. Right. And so he says, for too long, I just read, you read this and you can imagine, you know, this new Jew taking shape for too long, all too long, have we been engaged in the mortification of our own flesh, or rather to put it more precisely, others did the killing of our flesh for us. Their extraordinary success is measured by hundreds of thousands of Jewish corpses in the ghettos, in the churchyards along the highways of medieval Europe, this is before the Shoah, in the narrow Jew, before the Holocaust, in the narrow Jewish street, our poor limbs soon forgot their gay movements. In the dimness of sunless houses, our eyes began to blink shyly. The fear of constant persecution turned our powerful voices into frightened whispers. This is the diaspora he's talking about, which rose in a crescendo only when our martyrs on the stakes cried out, 
in their dying prayers in the face of their executioners. Let us take up our oldest traditions. Let us once more become deep chested, sturdy, sharp eyed men. Right. I mean, and we would extend that to to women as well. But um, so for for Nordau, right, the the idea of the of the of the physical Jew, right, the you know, and Nordau himself was a well known um, public intellectual that he right he 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 you know he, he sees what's happening in the world right and that and his understanding of zionism is that it needs to usher in a new era um, of physicality uh, into the consciousness of the jewish people um, this gets sort of extended uh to the the last thinker i want to i just sort of want to uh, to to frame this this period with, and that is Zev Jabotinsky. Um, and uh, there's a lot to say about Jabotinsky, but he really sort of um, formulated the idea that Jews need to defend themselves, right? And there's a, actually a direct line between uh, Jabotinsky, Menachem Begin, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, to a certain degree, like they, they you know, these these prime ministers are the the spiritual heirs of um, of Jabotinsky. Um, born in Odessa in 1880, Odessa in 18 in, in the 19th century was a hotbed of of Zionist thought. Uh, he was a secular, uh, somewhat um, assimilated Jew uh, who changed his name from Vladimir to Zev. Uh, he was a, a journalist in the beginning of his life, and um, he uh, he he is horrified by the news of the pogrom in Kishinev, and and Jabotinsky at the time and with other Jews starts to to gather uh, pistols and 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 spoke of the importance of of self defense. Um, he ultimately uh, is at odds with much of the Zionist establishment. Um, he thought that uh, Zionists were too passive, too weak. Uh, he, was, he was no friend of Ben-Gurion's. In fact, uh, Ben-Gurion would not allow him. He was buried outside of the land of Israel. Ben-Gurion would not allow him to be buried in Israel. One of the first things Menachem Begin did when he became prime minister was to bring Jabotinsky to Israel and bury him there. Um, and, uh, you know, Jabotinsky starts developing these, these units, these self-defense units uh, throughout um, the Russian Empire. And um, he, he names the group Beitar, named after uh, the Roman, the, the, the people who, uh, who were revolting against the Romans in 135 of the Common Era. And um, and here's a quote from Jabotinsky, right? So again, see the progression from Kishnev to Herzl to Nordau to Jabotinsky. The aim of the movement was very simple, though difficult, to create that type of Jew which the nation needs in order to better and quicker build a Jewish state. The greatest difficulty is encountered because as a nation, the Jews today, the Jews today are neither normal nor healthy. And life in the diaspora affects the intelligent upbringing of normal and healthy citizens. Um, Beitar will eventually spread through Europe, uh, building chapters in Poland, which, which is where uh, Menachem Begin gets exposed to um, the teachings of Jabotinsky. Um, at one point, the movement has 70,000 members. Um, and, uh, you know, he believed that from time to time, uh, Jewish destiny would require the use of force. And of course, history would prove him right. Uh, and um, we're going we're gonna to skip over my last source, uh, A.D. Gordon, just to summarize who he was. He believed in the importance of labor and agriculture. And you can see how these thinkers will begin to identify, and we'll send these slides out, these thinkers would, would begin to identify the streams of Zionism that will continue to sort of impact the land of Israel, you know, past 1903. And then, of course, when the state is, um, the, 
the state is established in 1948. Um, you know, it's these strands, the labor Zionist, the agricultural, the farmer, and, and of course, Jabotinsky, the fighting Jew, Menachem Begin. Right? Um, and and these, these are, in some sense, still, you know, right? It's not Zionism. It's actually Zionisms, right, mm -hmm. that are still in conversation today. And um, so, again, just to summarize, you know, for me, I think a logical place to begin this conversation is 1903. Kishnev was a, 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 um, an inflection point for the Jewish people, right? It was one thing to talk about the fact that there was a Jewish question and that Jew, Jews needed to control their own destiny. There was another, um, it's another thing altogether to experience Kishnev. For Bialik to frame the narrative the way he did that sort of led to the emergence of this new Jew, and then we see it become uh, part of the discourse uh, of the time. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Solmson. Thank you, Rabbi Zuckerman. Let's see here. Okay, so I, I do, I, I'm going to pull some threads from what Rabbi Zuckerman has shared with us, and we're going to fast forward. Um, you know, I want to reiterate, uh, we're, we're skipping over a lot, and I, I just want to own that. Um, there, there are lots of pieces of the puzzle. Um, I love what Rabbi Zuckerman said about it's not Zionism, it's Zionisms, right? There were, this was the birth of a, a new radical, radical departure in how Jews thought of themselves and how the wor world would think of Jews. And that birth process took from, um, you know, some, well, you, you could go back to either biblical times or the 18, late 1800s um, through, as, as Rabbi Zuckerman said, 1903, and we're going to fast forward to uh, World War I, or the World War, uh, as it was called then, uh, 1914, but we're really going to target 1917, and I'll tell you why. Um, you're looking at a slide. Um, it, during World War I, between 1914 and 1918, Great Britain um, really took over um, a huge amount of real estate, um, uh, um, kicking out the Ottoman Empire, which was um, controlling the area that was known as Palestine. Um, and uh, by the end of World War uh, I in, and around 1920, um, this, is, um, this is what uh, the, the blue area is the area that Great Britain uh, was controlling. Um, and what I want to do in this section of uh, is look at you know what's happening around 1917 um, and and how does Zionism go from something that uh, was an idea and a theory um, and a move a major move towards reality. So um, first of all, um, this snapshot on what what are American Jews thinking? Uh, I'm now rewinding the tape to where Rabbi Zuckerman started us off. Uh, but in 1885, there was a conference of reform rabbis in Cincinnati. And uh, in 1885, it's important that we remind ourselves what was uh, the mainstream American take on the question of the land of Israel. So we recognize in the Mosaic legislation, a system of training the Jewish people for its mission during its national life in Palestine, right? So back in the time of the Bible, we realized that that, that uh, national life was important. That's me commenting. And today we accept as binding only its moral laws and maintain only such ceremonies as elevate and sanctify our lives, but reject all such as are not adapted to the views and habits of modern civilization. We recognize in the modern era of, um, sorry, of universal culture, of heart and intellect, the approaching of the realization of Israel's great messianic hope for the establishment of the kingdom of truth, justice, and peace among all men. We consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community, a religious community, and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine nor a sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state. Now, this is before Kishnev and where Rabbi Zuckerman had us, but I think it's important to note that mainstream, or at least the reform movement, but I would say reflective of typical American Jews was this attitude that 
you're um, you're a Jew at home or a Jew in the synagogue, and on the street you're an American citizen, right? This is enlightenment, right? This is uh, I'm a, I'm a, a French person on the street, and my religion is Judaism. And again, Rabbi Zuckerman brought us to this moment that um, that there was an earthquake that began to be felt. But let's continue on. Okay, so the real sent epicenter of the earthquake is in 1917 when um, um, when uh, we get this declaration um, from Lord Balfour to uh, Lord Rothschild. Um, uh, and let's read this together. I found the um, copy of the actual letter. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this, this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. So um, this is huge. This is the first moment when the dream becomes a reality, when um, things begin to get concretized. And um, I, I hope everyone is picking up on two important caveats here, right? The um, existence of um, non-Jews in the land of Palestine, and they're mentioned in the letter, and the identity that Jews have in other countries as well, right? And we want to um, pay attention to all of that as um, as we think about this. But this is um, really a watershed moment. It doesn't feel that way to us. This is like we can look back. We know what happened in 1948. Uh, we know what's happened now. Um, but this was the first moment that uh, this is really pointed to as the moment of the the birth of the concept of a state of Israel, right? We went from the, the theory of Zionism that Rabbi Zuckerman talked about to um, the birth of uh, the concept of a state. Um, let's go on. Um, how did people react? So um, interesting response that I just want to share quickly. Um, I'm not going to read this. You can read it as I'm talking. Um, Edwin Montague is a cabinet member in uh, Britain at the time who happened to be Jewish, right? A Jewish member of parliament in Great Britain who um, really had a negative reaction and felt that um, the Balfour Declaration was really a step back for, um, for the Jews. Um, even might be considered anti-Semitic. So I, I, again, we want to make sure we're pointing to all the complexity, right? And, the, and that, you know, I don't even know, Rabbi Zuckerman, if you would call this Zionisms, but, um, but there were, it was not a um, unified response to the Balfour Declaration like that we may think of as a unified response today. Um, Again, just another map that shows um, what happens um, a little bit further down the line. We're now in 1922. And um, in 1921, the British decided to decrease the size of the Jewish national home and separate Transjordan, the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, um, approved the change mandate, which took effect in 1923. So Great Britain ceded um, um, a lot of, uh, of its control um, over and um, multitasking here for a second. Okay, what's next? Um, okay, we saw where Reformed Jews were in 1885. And I want to fast forward to 1937, which uh, on one um, hand feels like a lot of time, and on the other hand is not a lot of time when you talk to a historian. 1885 to 1937, um, let's see what they say. In view of the changes that have taken place in the modern world, which were many, 
and in the consequent need of stating anew the teachings of Reform Judaism, the Central Conference of American Rabbis makes the following declaration of principles. It presents them not as a fixed creed, but as a guide for the progressive elements of Jewry. And what did they say? Oops, sorry. Let's go back. Okay, we may have missed that slide. Hold on. All right. That's just slide is out of order. We're going to come back to the reform movement in a second because I want to talk about um, Churchill's white paper. Bear with me. Um, it's important to see, um, and again, we're not going to go through every moment, but um, the Arabs living in Palestine at the time um, were very upset at the Balfour Declaration, right? They, even though the Balfour Declaration mentioned them, and I'll go back and, and we'll have it in front of us, right? Um, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil or religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities. This isn't enough for the Arabs living in Palestine. And so Churchill writes a white paper to appease the Arabs in Palestine. Um, and he says, the tension which has prevailed from time to time in Palestine is mainly due to apprehensions which are entertained both by sections of the Arab and by sections of the Jewish population. These apprehensions, so far as the Arabs are concerned, are partly based upon exaggerated interpretations of the meaning of the Balfour Declaration favoring the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine made on behalf of His Majesty's government. So he's saying, Churchill is saying, don't, um, don't get carried away we are also thinking about the Arabs. Unauthorized statements have been made to the effect that the purpose in view is to create a holy Jewish Palestine. Phrases have been used such as that Palestine is to become as Jewish as England, right? He's trying to debunk myth and rumors that are circulating. His majesty's government regard any such expectation as impracticable and have no such aim in view, nor have they at any time contemplated as appears to be feared by the Arab delegation, the disappearance of the subordination or the subordination of the Arabic population, language or culture in Palestine. They would draw attention to the fact that the terms of the declaration referred to do not contemplate that Palestine as a whole should be converted into a Jewish national home, but that such a home should be founded in Palestine. All right, so um, the tensions and complexities never have left. Um, if you ever hear anyone start to talk about, well, who started it? I, I, my, my sense is that's not a productive conversation. Um, but Churchill here is trying to um, play the political game um, and trying to, you know, the law of unintended consequences were at play and trying to respond to tensions that came from the Balfour Declaration. Okay, sorry, this is the continuation of, of where the reform Jews are. I think this is very important, but I want to get back to Rabbi Zuckerman. This is a the revised platform of the reform movement responding to changes in the world. If you remember in 1885, they basically said, we, d we reject the concept of, of a nation of Israel. Fast forward some 50 years, and what do they say? Judaism is the soul of which Israel is the body. Living in all parts of the world, Israel has been held together by the ties of a common history and above all by the heritage of faith. In all lands where our people live, they assume and seek to share loyally the full duties and responsibilities of citizenship and to create seats of Jewish knowledge and religion. In the rehabilitation of Palestine, the land hallowed by memories and hopes, we behold the promise of renewed life for many of our brethren. We affirm the obligation of all Jewry to aid in its upbuilding as a Jewish homeland by endeavoring to make it not only a haven of refuge for the oppressed, but also a center of Jewish culture and spiritual life. They went from rejecting the concept wholly to saying that it needs to be a center of Jewish life. That is a dramatic change for American Jews, reform American Jews in the United States. So just like, again, looking at different moments and in different places of how people are responding to this concept of um, uh, Zionism. 
and Zionism becoming a real concrete reality. Okay, um, this is the beginning of a transition back to Rabbi Zuckerman. Um, we, we, we can't talk about any of this without referring to David Ben-Gurion. Um, this is um, a letter from 1937. We do not intend to create in Palestine the same intolerable position for the Jews as in all other countries. And this harkens back to some of the concepts that Rabbi Zuckerman introduced us to, right? What was the mindset of people who were thinking about why we need the state of Israel, right? What's the seeds of the Zionisms? It means a radical change for the Jewish people. Otherwise, there's no need for a national home. It is not to give the Jews equal rights in Palestine. It is to change their position as a people. I want to say one word on why we are here in Palestine. It is not because we once conquered Palestine. Many people have conquered a country and lost it, and they have no claim to that country. But here we are for two reasons unprecedented in history. The first is this. Palestine is the only country in the world that the Jews, not as individuals, but as a nation, again, this is language that is new for the world in thinking about the Jewish people. Jews, not as individuals, but as a nation, as a race, can regard as their own country, as their historic homeland. And the second reason is there is no other nation, I do not say population, I do not say sections of a people, there's no other race or nation as a whole which regards this country as their only homeland. Now, I'm sure some people disagreed with Ben-Gurion, but he was making a twofold claim here, right? That this is the historic homeland of the Jewish people and that only the Jewish people could claim Palestine as their only homeland. Again, some people would debate this. Some people would say, I disagree. Let's just see what else he has to say. All of the inhabitants of Palestine are children of this country, not only as citizens, but as children of this homeland. But they have it in, in their capacity as inhabitants of this country. We have it as Jews, as children of the Jewish people, whether we are here, here already, it's a typo, or whether we are not here yet. We are returning to Palestine, and we gladly and without qualification admit one very essential limit, and that limit is the right of the inhabitants of Palestine not to be injured. And here he's referring to all inhabitants of Palestine, regardless of religion. Nothing shall be taken away from them which they need for their existence and for their well-being. We came to add, not to take away. This is Ben-Gurion's philosophy. We came to create. We may and we will come, and we are entitled to come as long as the Jewish problem is not solved. And again, that harkens to what Rabbi Zuckerman was talking about, right? He's pointing back to a time, and the time still existed for him in 1937, where there was a Jewish problem, and Israel, or Palestine, was the solution to the Jewish problem. As long as there is need for Jews to come to Palestine, and there is a place for them in Palestine without displacing others. So his thesis was... Jews should be welcome here, not to the exclusion of others, but on an unlimited capacity. And with that, I think, Rabbi Zuckerman, I'm handing it back to you. Thank you, Rabbi Solomson. Um, just, you know, I want to reflect on two things that you, you said, which I think we, we should keep in mind. Number one, um, this unbelievable revolutionary movement um, took place in a very short amount of time, right? So if Herzl is convening a Zionist Congress at the end of the 19th century, you know, by, you know, 50 some years later, uh, almost, we're, we're already, you know, getting to partition, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. So these things are happening very quickly. Balfour white paper um you know there are there are some flashpoints of violence in the land of israel the you know questions of of the arabs come up right ben gurion addresses them head on right um this is a this is happening in the span of 47 years give or take a couple of years 
And number two is, I, I, it's, it's really interesting to highlight the point of, you know, the, the sort of transition from, you know, Zionism in Europe in the 19th century to America in the 20th century. Um, it wasn't a done deal completely, but, you know, um, we know that in the early uh, reformers uh, in their Cedarim and their prayer books, they would remove um, prayers of returning to Zion because they wanted to be seen as proud Germans, uh, you know, uh, right? This was yeah, part, of what, um, meant, um, part um, of what it meant to be um, we, emancipated. Sorry, to um, and even in America, for that matter, that, that there was some residual, uh, there was a lot of give and take between Ben-Gurion and the American Jewish establishment about where the center of Jewish life would be and the ambivalence of, of Zionism, given that Jews felt so comfortable uh, in America. By the way, it's not the first time that in history when Jews had the opportunity to go back uh, to the land of Israel in 586 when the temple was destroyed. You know, by 520 something, Jews were able to return from Babylonia, and most Jews who were exiled stayed in the land of Babylonia because life was good in the diaspora and life was hard in the land of Israel. And, you know, don't picture the land of Israel today that Jews were returning to in the early 20th century. Picture a far less developed, uh, hardened uh, life in the land of Israel. So, and of course, there's the Arab question, which is obviously very much part of the conversation today. All right, so let's move to the last part of tonight. And that is, um, you know, I, when I when I teach history, I like to think of uh, you know the, the dates that every Jew should remember, and this will not be on the final exam of this class. But I would say that there are at least three dates that every Jew should know. Um, number one is the year seventy of the Common Era, when the Temple was destroyed and Judaism moved from being a sort of geo-ethnocentric community, meaning that we were sort of land-bound. Um, you know, bound to the temple, and now we would become a diaspora people. Uh, I think the beginning of modernity, uh, let's call the French Revolution, uh, as the ideas, the Enlightenment spread and Jews were emancipated and we saw all the movements that we live in today sort of emerge. And the third one, well, you might be tempted to say 1948, um, which you can make a strong case for. I think you could make an even stronger case for November 29th, 1947, a date that we are coming up upon soon. There was also a street almost directly behind the street where Rabbi Solmson and I were, we were roommates in rabbinical school in 1995 and 1996, living in Israel, uh, Kaftet in November, that street, uh, you know, uh, was literally right behind where we lived. Um, so what happened? What happened on November 29th, 1947? Um, Rabbi, maybe you could go to the partition slide. Um, I think that it is one of the most historic moments in Jewish history, um, where as a result of the work of Herzl and uh, Nordau and Jabotinsky and Brenner and all the other Zionists and all the work of the Zionist Congresses and all the immigration that had taken place, all the development of the land, the United Nations Committee on Palestine recommended on November 29th, 1947, a partition of Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab, with Jerusalem to be governed by, governed by an international authority. Um, the vote was 33 in favor, 13 against, and 10 abstentions. Um, by the way, in a rare moment of Cold War solidarity, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union both supported this plan, which guaranteed the creation of the state of Israel, which would come in May of 1948. And just to uh, to look at the um, to uh, to look at the partition, uh, essentially, the Jews were given a sliver of land along the coast and um, a little bit of land up north and then the desert in Bar you know, Negev. Um, and uh, the Arab state was to consist mostly of what was is today the West Bank and Gaza and a little bit south. Um, the Jews um, 
you know, uh, one of the great one of the great things about Ben Gurion was he was not a maximalist, right? In other words, he was willing, you know, it's sort of living out. Uh, when my kids were in nursery school, you know, one of the rules was you get what you get and you don't get upset, right? And you know, Ben Gurion, uh, he said to himself and the leadership of the of the issue of the community, uh, we have a land. It's not everything we want, right? It's not even, by the way, you know, if you look at the Palestine, the Arab state, you know, surrounding Jerusalem, what we would, what, what is often referred to as Judea and Samaria, some of the most historic parts of the land of Israel, we didn't get. But Ben Gurion was a pragmatist, and he wasn't going to give in to that maximalist compulsion, and he he accepted it. All right. And it is an incredible milestone, right? Um, Barbara Tuckman, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, uh, once uh, observed that, I'm quoting, that of all the peoples of the world from the 3,000 years ago, it's only the Jews who live in the same place, speak the same language, and practice the same religion. The story of the return of the Jewish people to its ancestral homeland became, in short, one of the great dramas in the history of humankind. Um, and while I'm always interested in the history, I'm also interested in the memory of this moment, right? Because with history, we're concerned with an accounting of the facts, which we could give you, right? Every step of the way, Rabbi Solomon gave you some of that, the white paper, the this, the, the you know, the various responses. Um, but memory is, is also important, right? What can we learn uh, from this moment in terms of Jewish life in the present and what it might mean for the Jewish future. Um, so I want to take a few minutes and just reflect on this and then maybe we'll be able to uh, deal with some questions. The vote to partition, it's an astounding vote given the short amount of time. Um, it, it signaled to the Jewish people that we are now part of the community of nations. 30 years after the Balfour Declaration, a critical threshold was crossed. A historic step forward that we would one day become normal, no longer the stranger, no longer the outsider, no longer the object of hate and derision, right? The Zionist dream, the aspiration had been embraced by the world, 33 voted in favor, a world ready to set aside a millennia of anti-Semitism to see us and accept us as equal. Right? The Jewish people were offered the right to express their collective identity in a sovereign context. We would control our own destiny and attain national status alongside the Arab states. Now, 1947 also reflects the beginning of a new chapter in the Jewish people's attitudes toward the world. Now, would anyone remember 1947? We're talking about two years after the end of World War II. Would anyone blame the Jews if after the Shoah that we just receded into history, disappeared, or, or carried that hate and, and disdain for the world at large? And look at what uh, Elie Wiesel says. Rabbi, if you go back to that Elie Wiesel quote. Had Zionism, uh, let us be more specific, had Zionism and its demands not existed, what would have become of the survivors of the ghettos and the camps, the partisans emerging from the forests and mountains who, according to all logic, should have scorned the human race and dedicated themselves to hating and despising it? Outrage, betrayed, these men and women, disowned and victimized by society, had the right and also the means to pledge themselves to nihilism and let their anger explode, come what may. It had nothing to lose, no one to spare, no ties to country or life, no more illusions about the trend of history or man. They could have easily become social misfits, even criminals. Had they set fire to all of Europe, no one would have been surprised, but they did not. Right? These are people who find themselves in displaced persons camps and set up schools 
and bring in teachers and learn Hebrew and people are getting married and babies are being born, right? It's the resilience of the moment to not sort of, you know, drown in hatred and disdain, but, you know, to choose life, to quote the Torah, and to eventually get to Israel and to, to build, uh, build a society, right? I mean, yes, statehood would come a year later, but the fact that, that, you know, in 1947, as we said, and as Rabbi Solmson described the Balfour Declaration, 30 years later, to have the world say there will be a Jewish state and for the Jews to accept it and to build it is absolutely astounding. Um, the celebration was intense, right? I mean, uh, you know, what that moment represents. Um, I think that it's captured most beautifully in um, Amos Oz's book, A Tale of Love and Darkness, a book, a story that I return to over and over again. So I want to share with you, and then we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll push pause for a minute. I want to share with you um, just an excerpt from that book. Uh, he's writing directly about this moment of November 29th. Um, it's early morning, November 30th, 1947, and eight-year-old Amos and his father had been celebrating all night long, dancing in the streets, celebrating this moment. At 3 a.m., they climb into his bed, and his father tells him the story that how when he, the father of Amos's, you know, Amos's father had been a boy, he was a student in his Polish school, and, you know, his father, so Amos's grandfather had been a student in a Polish school and the kids stole his pants. And when Amos's grandfather went to complain, the, you know, so Amos's father's pants were stolen, his grandfather goes to complain, the boys joined by the girls attacked him too, taking his pants as well. It was utter humiliation. Then Oz relates his father the story he told them that early morning on November 30th, 1947. Bullies may well bother you at school or in the street someday, but from now on, from the moment we have our own state, you will never be bullied just because you are a Jew. Not that, never again, from tonight that's finished forever. Now, we need that narrative. Uh, we need to believe that we are safe. Uh, there'd be times and, you know, we, I, what text we didn't look at was the idea that sometimes we separate from the world like Abraham. There are times when we embrace the outside world like Abraham who argued on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, we have a task to be a light unto the nations. But 1947 marked a very unique moment uh, in Jewish history when the world's trying to begin a new story. And it, it does so by forming a homeland for the Jews. So how do we understand our role vis-a-vis -vis the world? How do we respond? How do we embrace that challenge to be a light unto the nations? Um, there are different ways to understand this moment, right? For some, it will be a moment of isolation. For others, it will be a moment of opening up to the world. Um, it is a story that continues uh, very much today. Um, and just to sort of um, close out this chapter, um, you know, in nine, November 29th, 1947, the partition vote is approved. On May 14th, 1948, uh, the um, state of Israel is declared by Ben Gurion itself is a fascinating story where he vote. There was a, a six person, you know, committee that, you know, I mean, Ben Gurion was declaring a state, but uh, it was like, you know, there was like one swing vote there, right? It wasn't a unanimous decision by this committee, right? The world, the people in Israel knew what was coming if they declared statehood, but they did. And of course, the, um, the Arab countries, the sur surrounding Arab countries attack. Israel wins that part, that chapter of the war. And I use that word very uh, deliberately, because I, I, I think that the War of Independence 
has never really ended, but, but we win that chapter of the war. And up on the screen now is the map of the armistice lines, uh, what Israel looked like um, after, after the war in 1948. Um, Israel expands its territory. Um, you see the Gaza Strip there in red. Um, the, the, the other part of, um, of the land that was supposed to be Palestine, the West Bank, is part now becomes part of Jordan. We'll talk about that next week in 1967, how that map will change again. But this is the map of Israel after 1948. Okay, and just to, to seal this, um, the so again, states declared on October, uh, May 14th, war breaks out May 15th, um, and by January 25th, 1949, in another historic moment, and we'll stop with this, we have Israel's first national election where David Ben-Gurion is elected prime minister. So imagine thousands of years of dreaming, right? State of Israel is declared and within a year, we have our first national uh, election. I spoke about this on Arab Rosh Hashanah before um, Ben Gurion goes to the first meeting of the Knesset, he stops along the way and he plants a tree. And one of the most Jewish acts I can imagine a prime minister uh, doing, uh, planting for the future. Um, so, you know, we've come a long way from Theodor Herzl and the end of the 19th century to Israel's first national election um, roughly 50 years later. Um, as Rabbi Solmson said, this is one of the great stories of revolution, uh, I believe, in the history of humankind. So with that, we're going to stop. Um, I think it's nine o'clock. We could probably take a few questions if people have them. Um, so great. We, we said we'd do an hour, um, but but we do, we're happy to stick around. And again, we'll record all of this in case you can't stay with us. I do want to say... We have up on the slide uh, a summary of what we covered today and what we plan to cover, not next Wednesday, sorry, but next sorry. Thursday at 8 p.m. So um, we hope you'll all come back um, next Thursday at 8 p.m. And um, and please uh, let friends know if they weren't here tonight, we will still, um, for a small cash contribution, we'll still allow them to join us uh, next week on Thursday night at 8 p.m. Um, Catherine, you have your hand up. Um, you, I, I want to encourage people to write your questions in the chat. Um, that would be helpful. Um, if you need to go, we understand you won't hurt either of our feelings. And Catherine, uh, you will, uh, you're unmuted. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, uh, even as a youngster and a student in Jerusalem, uh, but I'll take it from uh, the 70s or late 60s, when we would walk to the Ayer Atika, uh, we would, uh, uh, you know, if we uh, behaved in a, a manner that disagreed with them, the Orthodox people in Meshirim, um, they didn't consider us, they didn't believe that Israel, uh, you needed to come back to Israel. And we were sort of seen as outsiders and uh, our behavior. So my question is, why is it you you did yours so well that people from the same region of the world, Eastern Europe, Russia, etc., who were religious, did not accept anything that well, not necessarily anything, but did not accept that Israel needs to be in order to be Jewish. And even in this war, we see religious be, people being um, attacked and also attacking because they side with the Palestinians. And just, uh, and just this part of the question, why is that the people we lived with in Jerusalem, but also the people who come back to settle the West Bank? They have a completely different version than what uh, uh, you're presenting in many ways. They say we right. do and, not- uh, do 
Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I just want to make make sure we have some time. Um, I think I think um, I, I do want to um, reiterate for everyone that um, you know, Rabbi Zuckerman's uh, concept of Zionisms, and with that, uh, right, we had the Balfour Declaration, and we had a Jewish member of uh, parliament in Great Britain who rejected the Balfour Declaration. Um, similarly, as Catherine is um, is explaining, uh, we do have Jews uh, actually in Palestine and throughout the world who have a different reaction to the creation of the land of Israel. Uh, Rabbi Zuckerman, you want to um, spend a second just um, expounding on, on that piece, just just a minute, and then we'll we'll go to Karen. Yeah, I think that, you know, to the to the question, I, I think that there are, you know, Jews who have a different sense of theology and how um, this cosmic moment of return to Zion should happen. Right? For some, it can only happen through the hands of God and through some supernatural upheaval. Um, I think that for, you know, I think that for um, many of the early Zionists who weren't religious, many who came from religious families felt that um, the only way it was going to happen was through the work of human hands. Um, so yes, uh, you had these secular Jews arriving in the land of Israel where there was a, 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 a you know, for lack of a better term, an Orthodox community who might have looked down on these secular Jews, but the great link, uh, the, the great connector of this was the first chief rabbi of, of the land of Israel, and that was Rav Cook, who, 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 who saw the secular Jews and saw the innate sort of spirituality and goodness of what they were doing and really built that bridge between uh, these communities. And that was the kind of religious Zionists. So again, this Zionisms. Um, and, you know, even beyond the religious Zionists are ultra-Orthodox Jews who to this day don't really accept the sort of, you know, political reality of the land of Israel. Most of them live in Israel, vote and do whatever. There are some who we see showing up and standing with Palestinians in rallies, the Nictori Karta, who are part of the Satmar Hasidic you know, dynasty, but they're a small minority of Jews who actually, you know, sort of protest the very existence of a Jewish state. We have one more question, and I'll, I'll say if you're dying to ask a question, this is your last call for tonight, and, and we hope you'll join us next week on next Thursday night. Um, Rabbi Zuckerman, any uh, insight into, um, you know, at the end of the War of Independence, as we looked at the map and saw um, what what is known today as the West Bank was in Jordanian hands, the mm -hmm. Gaza Strip was in Egyptian hands, right. any, um, any color on on what happened and why Israel wasn't able to do even more um, when it come, the question was really about Gaza, but um, there, there, um, th that that sense of like what happened. I, I don't, I don't think I know the details other than to say the Egyptian army fought a, a fight that ended up with them preserving that land, and same thing with the Jordanian army. But any color there? I, I don't have much more. It's a good question. I don't have much more color on that other than what you just said, that these were formidable armies. And I think Israel probably secured what they could uh, in, uh, you know, in the War of Independence. And of course, that those these borders will be uh, revisited, um, you know, in 1967. Right. Right. Um, all right. And the last question of the evening uh, was uh, hearkening back to this question of, um, you know, was it a, a homogenous um, sense, but looking at uh, world Jewish reaction, um, do we have a sense of what proportion of the Jewish people supported the establishment of the state? What support, what proportion of Jewish people, right? Um, that's a whole other conversation of what what proportion of the world population, but what proportion of Jewish people supported the establishment of Israel in 1948? My sense is, is that it was the majority, but um, we've already pointed to pockets of uh, people. Um, but uh, any any color there, Rabbi Zuckerman? I, I, I don't have percentages per se. And I think even though, you know, so um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, Rabbi, from the AJC that Ben Gorion was at odds with. Um, um, I know who you're talking about. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, even so, so even people who may have um, felt, uh, well, look, you know, Israel, and remember the Jewish population in 1948, what was it like 600,000 or something? I mean, it was this very, very small community. Of 1937 was 600,000. Yeah. yeah. So, you, you know, the, the, the American Jewish community, for example, still saw the themselves world. as the power base of world Jewry, even though Ben-Gurion saw Israel now as the, the center of the, the Jewish center. world. So, you know, they were at odds at, on that point rather than, um, you know, whether they were going to support Israel. For, I think most Jews supported Israel. Um, you know, even if they were, even if they themselves were ambivalent about, you know, going there or thinking it should be the, the you know, the, the, the main center of Jewish life. I mean, that took years yeah. for that to happen, but. Yeah, I think, I think we're going to point to uh, what was the, it, what was the American reaction in 48 and maybe we can, excuse me, maybe we can do some homework before next week, but yeah. we do know that there was a really radical and I'm just teasing next week's um, session, but the American Jewish community's response to the six day war um, was was even more dramatic than what um, it may have been in, in 1948. So, um, but that's that's teasing for next week. Um, I wanna thank Rabbi Zuckerman. I wanna thank um, the adult education department because they did a lot of work in the background uh, to make this happen. Um, Rabbi Kaufman and Mara Bernstein and their whole team. And um, and mostly we want to thank all of you for making time uh, to be with us. Um, we know that having this context and this background is super important as you're thinking about um, the events of the day. Any closing words, Rabbi? No, just I, I want to echo that. I think that uh, these are really important moments. Um, we're living through our own, I think, inflection point. And the, one of many things that we can do uh, is to educate ourselves um, to the story of, of Zionism and the story of the state of Israel. Um, it's a complicated story. It's a, we're, we're painting very broad strokes because we have limited amounts of time. Um, next week we will, um, and maybe we can even send out some book recommendations, um, some things to continue to read, some news sources to follow, but, um, you know, I think that uh, this is a time for us to, uh, to, as I said, educate ourselves and know a little bit more about this story so we can um, stand with Israel. Um, and with that, I think we'll wish everyone a good night. Uh, Rabbi Salmston, thank you to you for all that you did in, uh, in creating this, uh, this moment. And we will see everybody, not Wednesday night, but next Thursday night. All right? And Thanks, uh, everyone. we'll see you soon. Okay? That's your call.